thank you, Jesus. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. Oh, my, oh, my. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. Somebody's questioning why they're here. And I'm giving you the answer. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. Oh. 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 From the depths of my heart, I sing. Oh. oh, oh. When I don't know what else to say. Do you know that your own means something to God? He interprets whatever it is. Thank you, Jesus. I want to, and I want to give them time to fix the mic at the same time because I hear myself going in and out. And I want to be obedient to the Spirit. I feel like somebody is questioning their existence. Why am I here? What is my purpose? Why did I wake up? Why? To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. God wants your life, and he wants your praise. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you not about my needs or my desires, but I want God to be pleased in everything I do. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. Can we transition to this really quick? My life is not my own. To you, I belong. I give myself, I give myself to you. My life doesn't even belong to me, it belongs to you, Jesus. Life is not my own. Oh, to you, to I, you belong. I belong. I give myself, I give myself to you. And I offer him no resistance. Because my life is not my own, to you I belong. I give myself, I give myself to you. We can keep a sweet spirit there. You may be seated. I have a few announcements, but I want you to keep that playing. Just to uh, wrap up our giving portion of the service for any of you who needed to text to give. You can text ANWA DC to 77296. Text ANWA DC and the amount that you desire to give to 77296. Or you can use Cash App, which is dollar sign ANWA DC. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I feel like we all know about the giving campaign. You know we're doing the equity campaign. You know you can give in to that. Yes, it's okay to get excited for that, even though we're worshiping, because giving is a part of worship. Thank you, Lord. So you know how you can do that. Uh, we, we talked about our visitors 
First time visitors, please text DCVIP to 94000. And we're going to do children's church today. Middle and high school, you can be dismissed to the back where I think Elder Kathy, I can't really see, but Elder Kathy or someone will be waiting for you in the back. That's middle school and high school. Am I correct at that? Y'all gave me the right announcements? Okay. All right. And I think that's it because I want to I wanna move on to what we're doing. I want to praise God for uh, Latrice and Nicole. Thank you. Elder Latrice, Elder Nicole. Yes, when um, it was hard for me because as I was sitting there, I was actually looking at how God is raising us up. And God is raising up his church and he's elevating people. And he's, he's brought these gifts to our house. And God is using them in ways that I, I couldn't even, I, can't, I couldn't call it. God is doing it just lets me know that there is something on their lives and there's something on your life too and you're in the right place to discover what that is but I'm so godly proud um, I don't know what their ages are but I know what my age is so I know that I'm gonna call you a daughter because I know I'm old but uh, <laughs> I love you all so much and for all that has been serving our captains um, uh, I see Mia I see Latrice, I see Astrid. I'm so happy to see Astrid. I wanted to hug you, but you were in the spirit, so I didn't, wanna, I didn't wanna break the spirit, but I'm so happy to see you back with us. God is so good, and Miss Renee prayed this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus, I'm so glad. I want you all to get to know Miss Renee because she's a powerhouse. She's a small frame, but she has a lot of power, and she ain't scared of nothing. Nothing or nobody. She'll look the devil square in his face and cast him out of you and then love you right on back to deliverance. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So I'm so happy. Well, as you know, Pastor JJ is not here. He had the opportunity and the privilege to minister at the potter's house. Yes. So it was T.D. Jakes that actually separated me and my husband today, and I don't know how to feel about that. About to tell T.D. Jakes to get ready because <laughs> we're going to have to have a conversation about him missing on these Sundays. Um, so what I tried to do is I tried to dress like him because I didn't want to disappoint you all too much. So I put on my ones and I put on a little hoodie and I said, well, let me try to be Pastor J.J. the best way I know how. Um, and so I know that I cannot deliver the word like he can, but I do have something for you. I absolutely have something for you. And if you know me, you know I'm not confident in myself, but I'm confident in my God. And I know that he would not put me in this position and leave me. But this week was hard for me. I'm not going to lie. This was a push. And I just want you to know that because I want to encourage you that when it's your time to get up, it's not going to be easy. You're going to war and you're going to second guess and you're going to be like, God, you sure you meant for me to do this? You sure? I'm careful of the people who's real confident in what they do. I think there's a blessing in being a little bit of nervousness because it says that, God, I'm relying on you. It's no goodness of my own. I will get up here and mess up. I don't have the degrees. You're going to hear some broken English. I might use the wrong grammar. I'm sorry for y'all Howard students. You may have to just tell somebody what I meant if you know it. Slightly Ebonics, slightly, you know, I, I try. But that's okay because God is going to get the glory and you're going to get the message. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So to worship him, I live. I gave my life to him and I surrendered and I'm not going back but I'm moving ahead. Brother Will, it's so good to see you. I know you've been traveling, but we've been praying for you, and it's so good. He went to it. You went to another country or something like that, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm glad you are back. Um, and my son, my son went to Africa. God is just blessing, and he's favoring us. My son got to shoot videos in Nigeria. I think he went to Nigeria. Is it Nigeria? He went to Nigeria. And don't worry, they all coming back COVID negative because they got tested. <laughs> 
So God is good and he's continuing to cover us. I want you all to allow me to be mother kind of like type today, if you don't mind. Um, how many of us was on our Bible study call last Thursday? Wasn't it a blessing? It was a blessing indeed, discovering the gifts and, and talking about the gifts that God has inside of you. And I was blessed by hearing what Pastor JJ had to say. And I want to continue on in that same kind of vein. But the reason I want to come to you as a mother is because before you get into the gifts, there's some prep work to be done. And I have to make sure you're prepared for what God has for you. I would not be a good leader if I did not take the time to prepare you. So to, how many of you brought your Bibles? Amen. I know everybody is not on Facebook. Everybody's not on, I think I put it on Facebook, but I'm determined to make us a Bible toting church. I love the hard cover, the soft cover, the leather bound. I love the word of God here. And let me tell you why. You're going to hear me say this a couple of times because in the apps, they are taking words and stuff out of the Bible. So, you know, when you get your little updates, sometimes they're removing parts of the scripture because it offends certain sectors of people. The only way you're going to really know what the word of God said is to get it in black and white. The apps are cute. I love the apps. I use them. They're really nice. But when I want to make sure of what the word of God says, you have to be able to pick it up and see what the word of God says for yourself. Because this world is changing and the world is corrupt. And they're so everybody's all uptight about what offends them. We are an offended generation. Everything seems to bring offense. But the Bible tells us not to take offense to everything. The Bible, I believe that the Bible is supposed to offend you. It's supposed to give you some guidelines. See, we don't like that. We don't like rules and guidelines no more. Everybody wants to do whatever they want to do, whatever pleases them. But when you join into Jesus, there's a way and a standard that you have to live by. And it's there to push you into the right way. So get your Bible. Thank you for all of you who were obedient. You're certainly going to use the word of God today. But today, you know, it's, a, it's Christmas season, and today I want to talk to you about being re-gifted, re-gifted. Did y'all do a graphic for me? I just needed to see the, gra the graphic. The Holy Ghost be working in our artists, so sometimes when I see their work, it pushes me somewhere. But anyway, we're talking about re re being re-gifted. Some of us are guilty um, around Christmas time of receiving a gift that you really don't like. And what we really do is we, uh, att in attempt not to waste the gift, we will give it to someone else. We'll say that this is really not what I wanted. It's not what I expected, and I really have no room for it in my life. So maybe Sister Latrice will want it. So I'll put a bow on it and perpetrate as if I went to the store and really thought about her and really took the time to think about what she would like and I give her my gift. I myself personally have a problem with only, you know, I'm not a hoarder, but it's like borderline because things to me hold sentimental value. So if you give me something, the fact that you gave it to me, I want to hold on to it. But that's not everybody's story. Usually an item is re-gifted because you have no use for it. You don't see its value. Or it, it contradicts with your morals, your style, your taste, your pizzazz, your preference. It's not appealing to you. You can take it or leave it. Or we have some people who call themselves minimalist and they don't like clutter. So anything that reminds them of clutter or that they can't find use for, they re-gift it. I looked up some of the things that are nationally known as items that are re-gifted, and I want you to raise your hand if you've been guilty of this. Candles, gift cards, I see some hands going up. Houseware, somebody give you a dish rag that don't even match your color scheme and you're gonna give it away. Clothing, shower gels, lotions. I don't like the way that smells. I don't even like all of Bath and Body stuff, and you done gave me $50 worth of Bath and Body, and I don't like the smell. Fruitcake. I know everybody in here is kind of young, and you may not remember fruitcake, but fruitcake is one of those things that nobody likes. 
and it ends up in five different people's houses. And don't you hate by the time you taste it, it tastes like somebody's perfume? Okay, anyway, these are things that are usually re-gifted, gift baskets, things like that, things that take up clutter or things that are usually re-gifted. But re-gifting doesn't sound uh, so good, especially when you talk about re-gifting people. It hurts. It hurts. See, we often can't see the use for a certain person in our life, so we pass them off. We can't see the value in the person sitting next to you, so you stick a bow on them and write them off. Very often you'll say, she's not appealing, he's not appealing, doesn't fit my taste or my liking, so I'm going to cancel them. Or maybe you're a victim of this. Maybe you're one of those people who has been gifted, tossed around from a few companies. Your job really didn't understand your talent, so they let you go. Or maybe there's some, some, some churches that you may have left because you felt like they don't really understand who I am, so I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna leave because I don't feel too comfortable here. You've been re-gifted, but you know what the saying says, one person's trash is another person's treasure. Do I have any treasure in here? So I hear you saying, why? Why have I been tossed? Why have I been re-gifted? What, what does that look like? But Psalms 119.70 says, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn thy statues. There's something about being hurt and disappointed and then looking in the word of God and finding out who you really are and the fact that God loves you in spite of all of your ways that people don't understand. It's something about that. You get to understand God. You get to understand why he does things and knowing that he does all things well. See, the Father needed you to end up in the right place. It's all a part of his plan. I know you can't see it, and I know you can't really understand it when you're the one being regifted, but there's a place that God has for you. And if he did not upset you here, you might not have walked away but he allowed something to upset you so that you can pick up your bags and move on to the next, and there you find Jesus. It's all a part of his plan. I believe gifted people are supposed to be here. They're supposed to be in this house. I know that's a bold statement, but I believe that this is the house for gifted people. Yes, so we can teach you how to steward yourself, and how to steward your gift. Don't be discouraged if you don't know what your gift is. I want you to know that you are a gift. The fact that you are here today makes you a gift. Now, we're going to go into all of discovering who you are and what's inside of you, but I want you to understand that you are a gift. You are a gift and you have a gift. I believe by the end of this series that God is going to start revealing some things to you and you're going to start operating in some things. But like I said, I have to teach you what's coming down the road. Your being here indicates that there is more. Your being here indicates that you are a gift. Today we're going to look at the life of Joseph because Joseph was a gift and he had a gift. Uh, Joseph was re-gifted a few times, as the story is going to tell us, and I understand. Can y'all hear me? Because I hear it cutting in and out, but as long as you can hear me, I'll work through it. The story of Joseph is an easy preach, but sometimes we need the simple things to help us understand what is happening in our lives. Do y'all need to change this? Y'all need to change the mic? Okay. Y'all know how technology is. So let's just do this and get it right before I get in my message and I get in the high gear and my mic start cutting out. All right, so yes, let's go into Joseph. Let's talk about him. Um, there are some lessons that we might overlook if we don't go through this with a fine tooth comb. And so I believe that's why the Holy Spirit would have me to go this way. I want you to say, I am a gift. I am a gift and I have been re-gifted. I'm going to prepare you for this new season in your life. J Joseph was a gift.
by his, for his father, Jacob, say, I am a gift. Jacob had two wives, Leah and Rachel. He really loved Rachel. He was tricked into marrying Leah, but his love and his affinity, his affection was really for Rachel. Leah kept having babies, and Rachel was barren. But in Genesis 30, 22, let's do this. Let's look at it. Let's open up your Bible. We're going old school now. I want to hear those pages flipping. No, don't, don't give me no mock page flipping. I want to hear the pages. Come on, y'all know where Genesis is at. If you don't, Children's Church is in the back to your left or to your right. You can be dismissed. This is the wrong class for you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, Genesis 30, 22, what does it say? Then God remembered Rachel's plight and answered her prayers by enabling her to have children. Something changed before then. Now, you can read the whole story when you go home, but something changed. She was, uh, uh, jo Joseph was a gift because she could not have children. So Joseph was a gift to both Rachel and to Jacob. Now I want us to flip over to Genesis 37 and 3. Yes, pages. Genesis 37, and I want us to read the third and the fourth verse. Go ahead, read. Y'all got the same version Bible, don't you? You see, I understand that if we were all using the app, we could go to the same version, but that's okay. You can catch enough of it to read along. Let me just break that down to you a little bit more. Let me read it for those who could not hear them. I don't know how you couldn't, but just in case. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. In another version, it reads that Joseph, Jacob made Joseph a robe with long sleeves. A robe like this was very intricate. I want you to understand what it means. It had many colors. It was indicating favor. Long sleeves indicated that it was not suitable for work. So anybody who had on long sleeve, they must have represented some kind of deity or some kind of high place or high postured person because they could not work with having long sleeves. So like I said, if you had on this robe, you were certainly not going out to the field. Let me pause right there and just make a point. Many of you have wondered why Pastor JJ and I have not imparted some of what is on us onto you. I am a gift. I understand who I am. And some of you know who you're gifting, what your gifting is. I am graced in the gift of prophecy. I can flow in prophecy. I can also flow in healing, restoration, faith, and miracles, discernment, and the distinguishing between spirits. I believe that that's what God has graced me with. And some of you may wonder, well, how come I can't have that? Well, I, I want to flow like that. I want to be able to, to flow and to prophesy and to teach and to discern spirits. I want to be able to flow like that. Some of this you can only get from God, but yet some of it is called impartation. The issue is I don't want to put something on you that you are not ready for. I've got to prepare you before I give it to you. Or furthermore, God will, in some cases, prepare you for it before he reveals to you what is in the inside of you. And this is no disrespect to anyone, but there's a certain level of maturity. I know we don't like that word, but there's a certain level of maturity that you have to have to be able to handle the weight of a gift. It's not easy. And if you're flying off the handle now because someone talked to you the wrong way, 
you're not ready. If you're going to change your social media handle to say prophet or prophetess after one encounter, you may not be ready. If you're going to post a flyer that says now booking for 2022 after leading one opening prayer, you may not be ready. One more thing. If you're super critical of what everybody else does when they're up here, you're not ready. Matthew 7 and 5 says, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye. And then you can see clearly how to help me remove the speck in mine. Don't judge what happens up here. <laughs> Because you're, you, you're, you're really not ready. You have to do your own self-work first. One of the reasons I feel like Jacob might have messed up is because he gave this robe to Joseph and something happened. In the fifth verse, and I want to make sure I'm reading this in the right version, but it says, in the fifth verse, one night Joseph had a dream. I want to stop there because a couple of weeks ago, I was up here and I was rapping and I had my Biggie Smalls going on. And y'all might have forgot that I was talking about Jacob. I was talking about how Jacob had a dream. And here we see much later in Genesis, now he, he the same Jacob is now giving his son a robe. And after his son took the robe, now we see that his son is having a dream. I think it might have been some impartation. Now, I'm not a Bible scholar, but I'm just going by what the Word of God says. Joseph started off being a gift, but once he put the robe on, we see him now operating in a gift. A disclaimer here, dreaming is not a spiritual gift, but it is a method in which God can and will speak. Everyone who dreams is not prophetic. And I want to tell you that because we have a lot of dreamers in here. And I don't want you to think that that equals I'm a prophetic person. But God, in those days, God would speak to people in dreams. It was a way of hearing God. I have to say that. I have to let you know that because that may be a way that God is saying something to you. Because um, God used dreams and he speaks through symbols. Everything about Jacob and both Joseph's dream was symbolic. However, in dreaming, however, in that time, dreaming was one of those ways. So it wasn't strange that now he would have this dream. Sounds like that robe brought about some impartation. Jacob may have... And, and like I said, uh, this is not Bible, so y'all hear that this is me. Jacob might have put something on Joseph prematurely. So that's why I've got to teach you how to steward yourself first. I have to know that both you and I are ready for what's about to happen to you. Jacob missed one of those parenting classes, and this is why I say that it was probably premature. What do I mean by that? That's what happens when you have too many kids. The parents be tired of chasing all the kids all around, so the youngest kid usually just get away with everything that the oldest and stuff couldn't do. But he presented his, this robe to him with all of this symbolism right in front of his brothers, the very people who hated him. So now it seems as though the father, which he is, showing favoritism to one of the children, and he did not prepare the other children. He didn't speak to the need of the other children. He didn't do anything to affirm the other children. I, even I, as your leader, could have the right intentions but the wrong timing. And I don't want to be guilty of putting something on you that you're not ready for. I'm really not ready for you to have. And I haven't prepared your sisters and your brothers. I'm telling you, don't think I don't see you. Don't think I don't know what's on your life. I have to just, I have to just take the time to prepare everyone for it. The father of these boys, Jacob, elevated Joseph and did not prepare his siblings. Verse 4 says that but when the brothers saw that their father loved him more, they hated him. That I think that there was something that the father did there to provoke even more hatred. They hated him. I'm going to insert this here, and I want you to prepare yourself, put on your seatbelts, because in a few weeks, we're going to start ordaining people in this house. 
and you're going to be a witness to it. And I'm telling you now, don't let hatred creep up in your heart. Because you see people getting elevated and because you see people with a title on their name, don't think that I missed it and I didn't see you. It's just going to take some time, that's all. But your day is coming. You're gifted too. Everyone say it. Say, I'm gifted too. That's right. You are gift. You is smart. You is kind. You is important. You is creative. And you is gifted. If I let some of you tell your testimony, though, I'm sure it was such a wonderful night. I don't even know if Leah is here. Um, we talked about the woe night and her testimony and how you had to guess who was who based on what the card says. When well, Leah got up and she said, she read her, the card and she said, somebody in here has suffered from domestic violence and they had 46 stitches in their head. And we all turned around. I don't think nobody really wanted to guess who it was. And then she said, it's me. And when I tell you she went in the back and started praising God and it totally flipped the way the women's night was supposed to go. This is what I'm saying. There is a purpose for you. You is important. You are supposed to be here. Leah is supposed to be here. When death could have taken her out by another man's hand, God spared her life. And I'm sure many of you have the same testimony. I'm really not supposed to be here. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I know if I gave you this mic, many of you would tell me how you had to dodge bullets for breakfast, but God... I know that many of you would say that God spared me from putting the own gun to my head because depression had riddled me. But God, thank you, Lord Jesus. God Almighty has you here. Why? Because there is more. And I'm going to be a responsible leader. I'm going to find out what that more is inside of you. And I'm not going to appoint people based on relationships and friendships but we're going to do this according to what is operating in your life. But you have to be ready, and I'm going to get you ready. But anyway, Jacob presents this coat to Joseph, and now we see in verses 5 through 8 that the gift now has a gift. I am a gift, and I'm not showing up empty-handed. I have something inside of me. I have something to give. And his Bible says that the, his brothers hated him even more than they did before. I want to let you know, this is a warning, that your gift is going to cause someone else grief. Because you are who you are, you cannot shrink back. You might lose some friends. Get comfortable with knowing that everybody is not happy about who you are. Everybody won't be happy about your elevation. Everybody won't be happy that you can operate in something and they haven't found theirs. But I want you to understand that hate and persecution comes right along with the gift. It's unfortunate, but it's true. So now, verses 9 through 11, we can see, and, and I want us to read it, but I want us to read it all together. <sighs> yeah, you would say, okay. Let me just read it. It says, soon Joseph had another dream. You turn to it. Genesis 37 and 9. Soon Joseph had another dream. And again, he told his brothers about it. Listen, I've had another dream, he said. The sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed low before me. This time he told, them the, he told the dream in front of his father as well as his brothers, but his father scolded him. One version says that his father rebuked him, saying, what kind of dream is this, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dream meant. I, I, I have to take my time with this, y'all, because the scripture just gives us such revelation. One of these things, it, it, it really troubled me. It really troubled me that I feel like Jacob knew that something had came upon Joseph in that minute. He recognized that there was some kind of gift. But even Jacob and his brother, see, jealousy will kind of blind you. It'll make you miss the message. It, it, it'll make you miss the meaning of the message. 
All in all, Jacob had 12 children, Joseph being one of them. But then you have to listen to what Joseph said. He says, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. Wouldn't the sun represent Jacob? Wouldn't the moon represent the mother? And wouldn't the 11 stars represent the brothers? I've come to tell you that you are a part of the plan. God isn't leaving you out. And furthermore, the sun, the moon, and the stars are pretty high-ranking elements, aren't they? So, 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 so if jealousy wasn't really around you, wouldn't you say, oh, well, I'm up there. I'm up there with the stars. <laughs> I'm up there with the moon. I'm, I'm up there. That's okay. It's all right that Joseph is the one that we're bowing down to. I'm still elevated too. Look at me, just as shiny as I want to be. Yes, I'm a star with twinkle in my eyes. Yes, I'm complimenting the sky like no one else cares. I mean, like no one else can. What I want to tell you is I don't care where you're sitting in this audience. You are a part of this body, and you are important from the front to the back. You mean something to this ministry. Put me in the back. I'm here. It's okay. It's okay if I'm not in the front. It's okay if I'm serving at the door. It's okay if I'm the one that they choose to clean the toilets. As long as I'm a part of the body, it's okay. But now we see Joseph is getting a really bad rap. He's operating in a gift that was just revealed to him a few days ago. And no one is helping him steward himself or his gift. And when he told Jacob, his father and his, Jacob, the father and his brothers, their dream, his father rebuked him. Parents, stop hushing your children when they have something to say. <laughs> when they start speaking spiritual things, we have to listen to them. Why are my children clapping? We have to start listening to our children when they're saying things. There's something spiritual about that. Yesterday, I, I was in my room studying, and my, I got up from my chair, and then my baby girl sat in the chair. She said, I'm sitting in the pastor's chair. I said, yes, you are, baby. Yes, receive it in the name of Jesus. She didn't even know what she was setting herself up for, but I'm speaking it in the name of Jesus. May the anointing be on you. I'm not going to rebuke my children when they say something that is pertaining to the things of the Spirit. And then the Bible tells us about Jacob and the brothers, that they, the brothers actually got jealous. Here's one of those parenting things that Jacob missed out is because he now rebuked him in front of his brothers. Jacob's reaction could have been a make or break moment. But because he rebuked someone, some, because he rebuked Joseph, his brothers already hated them. Now it added an extra level of hate. Here it is us, y'all. Here it is. I'm your leader. I know that my actions or my reactions can provoke how other people feel about you. So don't get mad when I don't rebuke people the way you want me to. Don't get mad when I don't sit people down when you want me to. Because I understand that my actions can control how you feel about that person. So I, as your leader, have to be very careful how I handle everyone in the room. Because I don't want to provoke your brothers and your sisters to not like you. I would go a little bit further with that, but I'm going to leave it alone. Right after Jacob rebukes Joseph, he ponders on it. He stands there and he says, you know what? I'm going to keep what he said in heart because I think now that my son has a gift. I think that there's something on his life. The, the new revised standard version, which y'all really need to have as well, it says, but his father kept the matter in his mind. He kept the matter in his mind. He pondered over it. I don't think, I, 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 I don't, he, see, you have to understand, Pastor Trina, I have to use visuals and stuff like that to make me understand what's going on or put the story together for me. And I, I believe that Jacob was probably standing there like, the, I done gave this man a God a robe. I done, and now, he, now he's taking it too far. Now he's saying he's having dreams about us bowing down to him. What have I done, Lord? What kind of mess has I, have I created? He recognized the gift but he didn't teach the others how to receive or how to treat Joseph. Neither did he affirm the others. I'm telling you this because I've got to prepare you. 
I know this is not the shout and jumping message that maybe you wanted Pastor JJ to teach, but I've got to prepare you before I put something on you. Now let's read verse 12, 37 and 12, 37 and 12. What does it say? Y'all not being good readers today. Where's my other Bible? Let's, let's do this. <laughs> Chapter 37. Or Jess, how, come you, how, how about you take your mic and read it? Let's get it together. Genesis 37. Yes. Verse 12. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to the pastures, their father's flock at Shechem. Yes. When they had been gone for some time, Jacob said to Joseph, your brothers, your brothers are pasturing the sheep at Shechem. Get ready, and I will send you to them. I'm ready to go, Joseph, said. Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along, Jacob said. Then come back and bring me a report. I want you all to understand this. At first, when the beginning of chapter 37, Joseph was out in the field working with his brothers. By the time we get to this, after he got his robe, Joseph was like, look, I got a robe. It got long sleeves. I'm not, child, I'm not going out in that field with them. They already want to kill me. But look, Jacob sent him out there. What if I, as your leader, send you out somewhere that is dangerous for you? And there are going to be times where you're re-gifted and, you, and you're put in a position where you're somewhere where, God, this don't look right. It looks like I'm in a dangerous place. It looks like something is not operating the way you said it was supposed to go. But you notice jo Joseph never came back to his dream. He never said, wait, I can't, I can't, I can't go out there with them. I, I told you I had this dream, even though it might have been in his heart. He never said it. It sounds like Joseph has an obedient heart, and he's doing exactly what his father said to do. Are you going to be obedient, even with your gift? Even with your anointing, are you going to be obedient? Ponder on that, will you please? There was, again, it was one of those parenting skills. He sends the gifted one out to where he is hated. The Bible says that Joseph, the Bible did not say that Joseph was scared. Didn't tell him that he was timid about anything, but he went where his father sent him. What if the father himself is re-gifting you? This is the beginning of Joseph's purposely regifting journey. Joseph was regifted a few times. The first time is when Jacob sent him. Sometimes it's dangerous right at home, but, Joseph, but Jacob sent him. It gets dangerous to be who you are and who you're called to be even at home, but you still have to do the things that God has told you to do. And that's why I want to prepare you that it may not feel good at home. I can't promise you that your feelings won't be hurt sometimes right at home, but you still have to be obedient to what God has told you to do. So here it is. Jacob sends him out, purposely regifting him. The second time, his brothers put him in a pit. They didn't see his value. They purposely regifted him. The third time, his brothers sold him to the Midianites. He was too much for too much clutter for them at that time, so they said, I'm just going to gift you somewhere else. The fourth time, the Midianites put a bow on him and sent him to Potiphar's house. He was trashed to the Midianites, so they just gave him up. But God put him in the right hands. When Potiphar got him, he saw his treasure. He saw how good he is. It may take a few times for you. It may take a few times for somebody to really see the value of who you are on the inside. But you better believe that you are being purposely regifted. Because when the right person gets their hands on you, they're going to pull back the layers of who you are and see the treasure inside of you and use you according to what the way that God destined you to be used on this earth. You have to stick with it. I know 
re-gifting hurts. I know sometimes you feel rejected, especially those who are creative. Creatives get the brunt of it. They feel rejected. They're like, you used me for all of my creativity, and now I'm no good to you. But you have to understand that the re-gifting is a part of God's plan. He has a plan in mind for you. And I don't want you to be so hardcore that you miss the will of God. I don't want you to be so hardcore that you say, look, I'm leaving here. No, allow God to re-gift you. Put you in the right person's hands. He was in Potiphar's hands. See, God will deliver you to the right person that will get to those untapped giftings, the things that are in your belly. God will get you to the right person to develop what that is. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Who knew that Joseph had a gift of administration? Who knew that he could be somebody that can be over everything and have the whole house running? Potiphar put him in charge of everything. And here it is, you're complaining because you got two assignments and you don't really like the assignments that they're giving you. Don't you know that that is setting you up to be re-gifted to the right person? Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm talking better than y'all telling me, but I know it's good. Who knew that a slave could end up being the HNIC at the same time? Who knew that when somebody left you that you would end up owning a company? Who knew that when that person cursed you out that you would end up being the CEO? Who knew that when they didn't even understand what you were saying that now you would be talking to millions of people? Who knew the gift inside of you but God? Regifting works telling you it works. Joseph had to go through so many changes and so many re-giftings, but his life was a big setup. It set him up to be the man in charge. This is why I say that I need to teach you. I need to teach you how to steward you because like I said, Joseph never complained. He never flexed. He never said, I'm a dreamer. He never said, you can't put me in the pit. Do you know who I am? He never complained. He knew that God had something in mind for him. Because you are gifted and you are a gift, you have to be able to weather some things. You have to be able to be tough. Now, see, I understand that this may not sound good now, y'all, but when you get elevated and somebody starts speaking bad about you and you don't know what to do and think you should quit, your mind is going to go back to this word. That rejection is a part of the plan. So I got to teach you now that it's okay to be rejected. Let's look at the scripture, 2 Corinthians 4 and 7. 2 Corinthians 4 and 7. Flip those Bibles. Flip those Bibles. Y'all know what 2 Corinthians is at, right? Okay. 2 Corinthians 4 and 7. I'm going to read it. It says, But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. I like one version, it says, now we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this surprisingly great power is from God and it is not from us. Why am I telling you that? Because there's something inside of you. There is a treasure inside of you that is surprisingly great. I want you to know that there are levels to what's inside of you. Some people's rejection of you is because they can't stand what's inside of you. It doesn't have anything to do with your outward appearance. Sometimes it's just the Jesus inside of you they can't take. Yeah, thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm guilty of this because I used to be the one that say, hey, I'm going to dress up. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that so that I can be accepted. Child, please, I will pull off my eyelashes and put on some J's because I know that the real treasure is down inside of me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's just that the hell inside of them don't necessarily agree with the Jesus inside of you. And when two forces come together, there's a collision and only Jesus can win. Thank you, Lord. My presence, your presence brings light to dark places. 
So that's why rejection comes. It's not because of you. It's because of what's inside of you. And if you really know your gift and see, I haven't even prophesied yet and you already turned your ear towards me. Why? Because you must know that there's something inside of me. My presence makes a difference. Your presence makes a difference. You have a treasure inside of you that has surprisingly great power. They're rejecting what is stored up in you, the living Jesus inside of you. Verse 8, I love verse 8. This is why I really wanted to read this together, but it's okay. Verse 8 says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Oh, thank you, Lord. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. If you are carrying the body of Jesus, if you are carrying the death of Jesus inside of you, I imagine that sometimes you're going to feel rejected. I imagine that sometimes you're going to feel hated if you're carrying the death of Jesus so that somebody else could have life inside of you. Do you know what a responsibility that is? Jesus, I'm telling y'all what the scripture says. It says that we are always carrying in our bodies the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible. You are supposed to get all the feels of being regifted. <laughs> If you're not, that means you're not doing enough. If you're the one that everybody likes and nobody has a problem with you, you need to put your hands to the plow a little bit longer. Because I guarantee you, the day one you start putting your mind and your focus on Jesus, somebody is going to hate you. But hanging there, the very person that rejected you, is going to one day need the Jesus inside of you. I have a little bit of a testimony. I was working a job. I revealed, as part of my reveal as the woman's thing, I said I was a corporate trainer. And there was this lady named Maddie Lapitas, and I hope she's out there. That's why I said her name. But my supervisor's name was Maddie Lapitas. I'm not afraid of you. She pulled me in a meeting, and she said, I don't think you get it. I don't think you understand what's happening here. And me, I was young, so I just bursted out in tears. I didn't know what to do. I had never had nobody talk to me like that. I'm a pastor's daughter. I get everything. Everybody wants me a part of everything. And here it is, you're telling me that you don't think that I get it? I can get up and speak to people. I can get up and train people. This is all the stuff that was going through my head. Meanwhile, I was just sitting there crying, hurt. I didn't realize that she was setting me up to be regifted. You know what I didn't do? I did not leave the job. I stayed right there, knowing that she did not like me, knowing that she had this perception of me without ever having a real conversation with me. She had this undis perception about who I was and what I didn't get and why I wasn't qualified. And then Maddie took sick. And all of a sudden, everybody wanted to call on the pastor's daughter to pray. Well, I did. I did pray. But you got to be careful who you're messing with. You have to be careful who you're ridiculing and who you're coming up against. You don't know me like that. You don't know. This could either go one way or the other. And there may be a time that you may need me. Keep your mouth off of me in a nasty way. I'm a child of God. And I won't even have to fight. But if you're ever in a position that you need prayer, you might need to call on me. You just might. Let me tell you, this is one of the reasons, y'all can be seated because y'all going to push me somewhere and I'm not ready to go. This is one of the reasons why we have to teach our young people that they can't lead every time somebody up gets on their nerves. I don't always subscribe to the notion that says, if you don't get a seat at this table, make your own. I believe in sitting there at that table where people are rejecting me and praying until their minds are changed. 
I believe that there's some tables I'm going to have to sit at because I'm carrying the treasure inside of me that represents the death of Jesus who was bruised, battered, and rejected. And I've got that same thing inside of me where I can sit at your table and all of a sudden your no will be yes. Sometimes we just have to stay there in the face of rejection and let God be God. Thank you, Lord. The scripture tells me that he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You think I'm not going to show up? I'm absolutely going to be there. And if they're getting on your nerves real bad, that must mean your nerves is exposed. Cover them up and sit right there at the table. Don't forget to come and pick up your... Pick up your feelings. It's okay. It's okay. This is not about your feelings. Your feelings are sometimes going to get hurt. Sometimes you're going to feel the rejection. It's okay. It's a part of your regifting package that comes with benefits, by the way. Thank you, Jesus. I want all of the gifted people to read verse 11. We're going to try this, y'all. Just read it in your version. Just read it in your version because I want you to understand this. I want you to get this. Read it in your version. 2 Corinthians uh, 4 and 11. It says, for while we live, we are always being given up to the death of Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. Did y'all get that? For while we live... We are always being given up for death, up to death for Jesus' sake. Doesn't that sound like rejection might be a part of it with your gifted self? Doesn't that sound like somebody may misunderstand you with your anointed self? You think Jesus wasn't anointed? The proof is in the pudding. He got rejected left and right, but he still pressed through the rejection. Maybe you don't understand what the life of Jesus really is. So Isaiah 53 and 2 paints a good picture for us. It says he grew up before him like a, like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no stately form or ma majesty to attract us. No beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Let me just pause. Wait a minute. I'm gifted, but yet I have to be acquainted with grief? I'm anointed. I can prophesy and slay people here and there, but yet I have to be rejected, yet I have to be a person of many sorrows? Did y'all listen to Apostle's message this morning, elders? Those of you, especially those of you who are getting ready to be ordained elders, do you still want it? You have to be acquainted with sorrow. You have to be acquainted with grief. It is a part of who you are, and it is a setup for your regifting. This message is sobering, I'm sure. But the life of Jesus should always be at work in you so that it can be life to someone else. That's why I sang, I give myself away. I give myself away so that you can use me. My life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself away. There's a risk in being gifted. It's risky business. But you have to say, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. You have to be acquainted with rejection. Number two, here's I'm teaching you. Rejection was the first one. Get acquainted with it. It's going to happen. Number two, don't root yourself in the gift. Root yourself in God. Colossians 2 and 6 says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving, in every circumstance, abounding in thanksgiving. I need to be a mother right here. Because when people find out that you're gifted, they're going to start screaming your name. Don't believe the hype. 
They're going to start telling you how good you are. All of a sudden, you're going to have groupies. There are going to be people surrounding you saying, you're the best. Can't nobody sing like you. Can't nobody preach like you. You are the best. You belong on the big stages. And it's okay to have confidence. But let me warn you, let me warn you, stay humble. Stay humble. Because after a while, you will start to believe this. And your head will all of a sudden become bigger. And the problem with being big and bad is there's always somebody who's bigger and badder than you. You'll meet your match. Calm yourself. It is God who has made you the gift. And it is God who has given you the gift inside of you for the purpose of serving others. There's a difference between God elevating you and people elevating you. Jesus knew this. He knew it. There, I think it's in somewhere in John where it says that Jesus realized that they were about to make him a king, their earthly king, before that he was really supposed to be the king. So he withdrew himself. It's okay to come away from the crowd and withdraw yourself and fall on your knees and say, God, it's only because of you. I know so many people who are messed up. And they depend on their gift for every dollar they get. That's because they're rooted in the gift and not rooted in God. It is God who gave you what you have. Don't you ever think that your voice is so good enough that can't nobody take you down. Don't you, you're setting yourself up to be used even more. I know y'all don't want to hear this. Don't root yourself in the gift. Root yourself in God. The first one was what? The second one was what? The third one is submit yourself to God. Submit yourself. Second Timothy 2 and 20, and believe it or not, y'all, I'm almost done. I'm almost done boring, y'all. And then uh, Pastor JJ can come back and clean up what I messed up starting my life over again. I love that song. Gotta clean up what I messed up. Starting my life over again. <laughs> Somebody get 2 Timothy 2 and 20. Just go ahead and get it because you, you know, you don't need no mic. 2 Timothy 2 and 20. You have it? Yes, ma'am. Okay, read it. In a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones are used for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean. And you will be ready for the master to use you for, very, for every good work. I want to, wait, we're going to go a little bit further. But I want you to understand what submitting yourself to God looks like. It may mean that you can't do really what you want to do. That's what it may mean. Because it says that you have to be able to, to be ready to be uh, fit for the master to use. So what if you're drunk somewhere and somebody needs a little help? You have to deny yourself of some things because you have to, you have to be, you have to live a submitted life. I know that things are enticing and there are things out there that are going to pull you here and there, but you're living a different kind of life. You're living a submitted life to God. That means I may have to say no to parties. That means that I may have to say no to all the extra invites because I have to be fit for the master's use. I know it's hard. I know. I know. This is not what you expected to hear from church today. I know. I know. Just read 22. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Let's just stop right there. See, y'all think lust is just sex. And while you may need to stay away from that, there are some other things that you're going to need to stay away from. Let me tell you, this is just 
my definition of lust. Anything that entices your spirit that is not of God, it might be lust, which could be sex, which could be partying, which could be weed, which could be you fill in the blank. Whatever triggers you to want to go have a good time, it could be lust. It could be drawing you in. But what does the Bible say to do? It says to run! Run! Don't walk. Run. Leave. Why? Because if you sit there long enough, the enemy is going to entice you to do something that you had said when you came there that I'm not going to do. You said I'm only going to go this far. You said I'm only going to do this. You said we were going to leave at 8 o'clock. You said I was only going to have one drink. You said I was only going to touch her thigh. That's what you said. told you I needed to be a mother today so I gotta let you know there ain't nothing new around the corner I've been there myself I know how it is we said we wasn't gonna take our clothes off we was just gonna kiss I know I know I know you said we were just gonna do hookah we ain't had no nicotine in it I know I know that's what you said I know I know I know, I know, I know. I know you had an accountability partner. You told your friend before you left, don't let me do it. If I do it, pull me. That's what you said, I know. And then you turn around and both you and your friend is on the floor. Let me tell you, the power of the enemy is strong. It's strong. And I know y'all prayed before y'all left. I know. But that's why. As soon as you see him. See, y'all like, like dark and cherry. Y'all like uh, Idris Elba and all that kind of stuff. You give me J.J. Harrison. You give me yellow. That's my favorite color. I know. I know when y'all see him, he looks so good. And you say, no, I'm not, I'm going to keep my distance. I'm not, I'm not going to. And then before you know it, he done got you a drink. And y'all sitting somewhere talking. And then talking leads to touching. And then touching leads to. And you know you got to leave prayer tomorrow morning. You know it. You know Nicole asked you to come up here and lead the prayer. But you gotta live a submitted life. You gotta live a submitted life. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You have to submit your life to God. It's going to alter you. See, I'm telling you this now so that you understand when you say yes to God, something comes along with that. Yeah. Yeah. So when you say, I want to be an intercessor, or when you say, I believe God is calling me to this, and I believe God is calling me to that, there's something comes along with that. It's not just a title. It's a submitted life. Do you think I want to be up three or four o'clock in the morning praying? Got my fine husband in the bed and God wakes me up and say, come on, daughter, it's time to pray. It's not an easy life. It's not. So I just want you to understand this, that when you're telling me, Pastor Trina, what's inside of me? What's inside of me? You got to be ready. And I can't be like Jacob. I can't put it on you before we're ready. You've got to live a submitted life. You've got to submit yourself to God and you've got to submit yourself to this house. You've got to submit to this leader. Hello, I'm here. I'm here. I might pull up at one of them parties and be like, hey. <laughs> yes, submit yourself to the house. Submit yourself. Submitting breeds accountability. Now, let me, I know y'all don't like the word submit. But let me tell you something, submitting has nothing to do with your ability. You're grown, you can do whatever you want to do. I understand it. But submission is not about your ability. Submission is about your humility. That's what it is. 
I'm not taking away. If you want to build a house, if you want to do anything you want to do, you have all reason and all power to do it. Why? Because God gave it to you. It has nothing to do with me. But submission says, is it my time? I'll wait. I'll wait on you, Jesus. I'll wait until you say I should do it. Submission is about your humility. Let me tell you, the weightier the assignment, the more submission is necessary. If your assignment is here, your submission got to be right here. Okay? Look, I'm going to end. I gave you all enough. I gave you enough to ponder on. What was number one? Are we ready to deal with rejection? All right, because look now, y'all, that means that you can't quit every time. When Pastor JJ and I come to you and we have to tell you something that is not pleasing to your ears, the answer can't be, well, then I quit. That can't be the answer. You have something inside of you that needs to be cultivated, that needs to be matured, that needs to be grown up. And there's a process that comes along with that. What was number two? Right? Don't be so proud of what you have that you put all your hope in everything you do. I know a young lady who travels from here to wherever because she can sing. And I mean, God knows she can. She can sing. But she's rooted in her gift. And so when people reject her, she doesn't know how to handle herself. She loses it. It's because she's not rooted in God. She's rooted in the gift. The third one was live a submitted life. Submit yourself to God. Run from the lust of your flesh. Run. He's provided a way of escape. Run. 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 